our foster care system is shattered. And this podcast is about how we as a community can come together to bring about change, change in the system and changing the lives of children in foster care. Hi, my name is Rob Shear. I'm the founder of a national charity called Comfort Cases. I'm an advocate for children in foster care. I'm a public speaker. I'm an author of a forever family, but most important, I'm a dad to five of the most amazing kids. Welcome to the Fostering Change podcast. Well, we're back for another episode of Fostering Change, and I will say I am really excited. But for those who know me know, I'm always excited, but this one particular guest, wow. You know, I talk about making my heart smile. Um, Connie does that. You know, I was very, very fortunate that I had been following Connie a while back. Um, and I never thought that I would ever get to meet her. I never thought that our paths would ever cross, even though I knew we were both so passionate about foster care. And then it happened. Um, it actually happened and I got to meet our next guest and she is as amazing as I ever thought she would be. And immediately we became good friends. And um, I love the fact that I can reach out to Connie going and I can say, I need, I need to vent. I need help to understand what's going on here. And she is there. So ladies and gentlemen, some of the most amazing guests we've had, but I will tell you, I am thrilled to death to introduce you to my friend, Connie. Connie, how's it going? It's going great. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so you've been going through the whole pandemic. You're actually in a state um, that you've had some high numbers down where you're Very at. high numbers, very high numbers. And we just moved everything indoors. It, it caused a lot of challenges like it has for everyone else across the world. But we really, really just, um, for my family, we really tried to shut down. And it definitely caused some challenges within the family too. Yeah. So, so with your, with family blooms, um, you know, uh, how has this pandemic affected your, first of all, I'd like for you to tell everybody about your organization called Family Blooms. Okay. So Family Blooms is an um, adoption agency, but we really um, try to be a lot more than just an adoption agency. We are very birth mother focused in the sense that we are really working hard to give birth mothers every choice possible. And that includes keeping their child. That includes making a choice that may keep their child from going in foster care. Um, we really like the moms the best. I mean, we love all moms, but we love moms that are struggling. We're really hands-on social services support. What can we do to help you? What can we do to hook you into the community? So for us, um, the first challenge was our office was in a very big building. So we really moved everything offsite. And then we were in the field still. So we were meeting, in fact, the birth mother that we had um, about three months into COVID became COVID positive. Then my director became COVID positive. Um, we were delivering babies that in the midst of the pandemic to where you were going in and you know we're there to be their birth coach a lot of times. And so we would be literally locked with them for, we, we, you, once you went in, you couldn't leave. So we were delivering babies in the hospital, you know, and, and 48 hours, we were with the birth mom. It was intense to see them give birth and not be able to hold the baby. Oh, gosh, I couldn't so, imagine. The grief. Could, you know, Connie, I will tell you the one thing that I love about Family Blooms, and something that I've said quite often, we fail um, when it comes to supporting the biological parents. Yeah. Um, and, and we need to do things before a child enters foster care. That, that should be that the goal should be don't let this kid go into foster care because we know exactly what happens we know that you know the everything that you can imagine you've gone through it you've you're an adopted mother you you've been through the system with you know yes. seeing these kids i've gone through it i've been through the system my five children um foster care is not the answer but what you're doing is, I love what yeah. you just said, by the way, Connie, you said you connect them within the community, you know, giving them essential. that community support. Yes, it is essential for them to be linked. Um, you know, and also 
it's essential to empower them to be able to reach those supports on their own and um, to not be another victim, meaning that that victim mentality of the state came and took my child could keep them going in circles for a long time. But when they are empowered to make a choice, to make a change, we say, what do you want to do with your life? If now isn't the time for a family and we really, really cannot do this, you really cannot be a mom right now, we will help you have an open relationship. We will, but we want that for you. Whatever you know you see happening, but how are you going to change your life? How are we going to stop the cycle? For you, this could be your, your first child or it could be your third child. You know, the last couple of birth moms we've had have lost two and three children to foster care. And here they're on their third or their fourth. And we want to make this experience different for them in the sense that we can't take away the loss or the pain or the primal wound, but we can support them. We can link them and we can have them know that by taking that, making that decision their own to choose to place a child with a family that we will stand by to make sure it stays open. I think that's, you know, what people think about, but I don't know that it always happens. Yeah. And we're just determined to make that happen. I can tell you it doesn't happen from anything that I've seen. And um, I think it's really important that, you know, children, first of all, I, I'm the I'm the guy, I'm going to say it, I don't think children should sit on the sidelines and wait for adults to be adults. I don't think that it is, I, I don't think that it's fair and I think it is so much damage to a child to have to sit and wait for an adult to be an adult. But I also think that we we truly must invest, invest in our community. And when it comes to investing in our community, we invest in these families. So one of the things I've I always thought was kind of crazy is that we're able to give foster parents a stipend, you know, to give them that stipend they have, but we're not able to help a birth mother, you know, find a job or giving her a stipend that maybe would put her in a better situation that, you know, I, I just, I, I, I just think we're just backwards. We are in family preservation. I'm hoping there's a move towards that with the child as the focus that we are not blindsided that, you know, we have to look at the whole picture, but giving that birth parent, you know, instead of having a checkbox, you know, made a referral, made a referral, how many people in the midst of their trauma and anguish and life situations, culture of poverty can really, really take a referral and go do something. Now, can they take a warm contact and do something? Can they take, can you hold their hand and take them to the food bank? Yes. But you know, sometimes we don't realize we're not compassionate to the situation that our birth parents are coming from. And I think it's extremely important to recognize that part of the triad. Um, and, you know, I, I totally agree with you that, that helping them um, step up and connect to resources that are going to keep them. We're actually moving on. Um, COVID did teach us something very important. We don't want to be in more of a downtown setting. We are actually moving into a community center. Um, I'm on the board there and it's in the heart of St. Petersburg. On the bus route, it's got a food pantry, it's got a dress for success, it's got all these programs there. So we're very hopeful that our little office there will add something into the mix of the community. There's an after school program and that we can just reach people, you know, in the heart. And, and that's truly what a social worker's heart is when yeah. you start to do this work. It's, you know, um, I don't go, I, I certainly, and, and this may sound absolutely crazy, but did not create Family Blooms um, for the money in adoption. And, and I had to actually struggle. I had to actually struggle though with leaving. Um, I didn't really leave child welfare, but stepping aside into this part of it. And how is it going to make a meaning for me? Um, I'm still a huge advocate for child welfare reform. And, you know, um, well, we added a component to Family Blooms, which is child welfare navigation. And um, I think that is essential. I think that, you know, I learned with my son Davion, 10,000 people called to adopt him. None, very few got processed. He was given one family. What happened to those other families yeah. that called? And um, I will make an impact on that one day. And so helping those families that are coming in with those calls and navigating that system, you know, it's not just, um, we'll give you a study and good, good luck out there. Yeah. 
You know, you know I, I'm glad you brought it up about your son because um, for those those of you who recognize Connie and um, you recognize the name and her, she just said her son's name, um, you actually were a viral sensation that went, you know, literally unbelievable. I remember reading about it. I remember reading about your son. I remember um, saying to my husband, whoever she is that just did this, um, what an unbelievable human. So, you know, get, let's take it back a little bit because I want our viewers and our listeners to hear, um, oh, gosh, because, you know, you are so unbelievable, Connie. You don't pound your chest. You know, for you, to, I just saw that little comment where you made, you know, making money. Let me tell you something. Um, they're so far not you, um, but what you make is you make love, your family that you're building. Tell me about your son. Okay, so I was a, you know, professional in child welfare. I was a caseworker, a recruiter, built a heart gallery, and always loved all my children. I had a full plate at home. I'm a single mom. I was divorced. I had to have had two daughters who were high maintenance. <laughs> and so um, decided, though, that this child I had adopted, I ended up adopting one. He was 12 at the time, been in multiple placements, 47 placements. Um, by the time um, he came. And this was his friend. I knew this um, child from the Heart Gallery. And we asked to have him to our house. Can he come on the weekends? Can he hang with us? Because the boys are friends from being in residential before. And we just want to teach him how to be a family. Always loved him. I had known him since he was little. He was 15 then. We said to him, what will you do to find a family? He said, I would speak at churches. I would do anything. I don't care what my family looks like, if they're black or white. or So we took him to the, um, the black churches in our community um, because I felt that that would be important for him. And I had a relationship there. Um, and he started to speak. We did a news story. It went viral. And I'm, when I say viral, it was, it, my friend wrote the story on a Sunday and by Thursday, we were on ABC World News. On Monday, we were on The View. And um, I was a social worker, I wasn't his mom. Um, but what I saw was, a, <laughs> I saw a broken system. I saw a broken system that was more than I had seen before. I saw a system that was interested in the media coverage, but yet we had a 15 year old boy they had never spent time on. Truly, truly, he was born into care. You know, rights weren't terminated for seven years. Why? Because he was forgotten. There's no, there's no reason. Um, relatives had not been looked at, all those things. And here we were. And so um, I left the agency and Davion did um, go to a family. When he went to that family, it broke down and that made world news too. So if you can imagine um, being in a place when I get, still get real emotional and then opening up the world news and you're coming home and you failed and all his information was out there. And so he kind of went into seclusion. They put him in um, a foster home where he couldn't reach anybody. He didn't have a phone. And um, about a month later, he got a phone and he called me and his mentor. And he just said, will you adopt me now, Miss Connie? And I just said, absolutely, I'll adopt you now. Wow. So we formulated a plan and we actually fought the system to adopt him, refused to let him age out. And he, he, he pushed it, he wanted it. And I wanted it, my family wanted it. And so um, we did that. And he finalized before he was 18. Um, I'm gonna fast forward, he didn't graduate for a couple years. He was in, it took a long time for our family to settle in and just oh, feel yeah. comfortable. And then um, he is now in college and he is um, at the Culinary Institute of America. Oh my God, I love that. He's in his third semester. Um, he called me last week to say that he may have an internship in Aspen. Oh. Um, he loves cooking. He loves it. He has found his passion. Um, but it was scary for us because I honestly didn't know if he could write the essays to get in college. Right. So um, he was given the scholarship, I think, and then had to catch up. And he did it. He did the hard work there. Wow. And um, it's a four-year hard, incredible program, but he found where he wants to be. And um, I'm super proud of him. I haven't seen him since Christmas. 
Oh, I cannot wait. Listen, Connie, we're going to take a quick break because I can, I have got so many questions about that and so many questions that I think our listeners and our viewers really want to hear. Remember, you can always email us at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org for all your questions. Please make sure that you um, leave a review for those who are listening on your amazing platforms for your podcast, whether it's Apple or Google or Stitcher or Spotify. Um, leave a review and share. You know, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and leave a comment. Um, you know, it's so important. What we're doing today, the talk that we're having today is the talk that people need to listen to. The listening is truly what makes our change within our community. It's our community that we need to build back up to support. So foster care is something that is very small within our country and not as large as it is right now. We'll be right back. This episode of Fostering Change is sponsored by Comfort Cases, a national nonprofit that is inspiring our communities to bring dignity and hope to youth in foster care. You know, for just $10 a month, you can support the Comfort Cases mission to eliminate trash bags from the foster care system. For every $10 donated, a Comfort XL duffel bag will be given to a child entering foster care. Please help us be part of the change. Go to comfortcases.org and see how you can help a child entering our foster care system. Welcome back everybody to Fostering Change. I am so excited to be here with my friend Connie Going. You know, she is an inspiration. Um, she had been telling the story about adopting one of her children. Mind you, she has, Connie, you have four kids. Um, I have four, yes. Four, two boys, two girls, you yes. know. Well, um, actually, actually, I have three boys. I have a have three daughter boys. that has transitioned. So, and I have a new son. Oh my gosh, I love that. I absolutely love that. So three boys and a girl. Um, it truly brings your whole circle together. You know, Connie, we were talking before we took a break um, about, you know, how the system had failed your one son. In, in, and one of the things I, I heard you say was that you finally saw really how broken the system was. And I think as social workers, which by the way, I say this quite often, the most underpaid, overworked people in our country, um, they are given caseloads that are out of control. And the reason I feel, and this is my personal opinion, the reason I feel that you finally saw the brokenness of the system is because it's the first time somebody lets you lift your head up from a file. You know, I mean, that, that's exactly what I see from social work service workers doing referral after referral. I mean, you're constantly in that file. You're constantly, and you're not able to see the bigger picture. You no, you are in a silo. You literally can just get through your day, get everything done. And then for the ones that, that do, I mean, they are many, many, many good ones and they do more than they're supposed to. It still isn't enough. You know, you can't fit it in 40 hours. You can't. You know, so um, I had always been the type of person who lived what I did. And I think that'll all always be that way. But for me, it was all consuming. You know, you would, and how, how do you, when you can't get everything done, when you can't, when you know you're responsible for a child that is out there and they have no one else, you know, it, and it's overwhelming what we have put on them right now. I mean, there are good models out there, but we are not following them as a state in Florida. Yeah. I, by, by the way, like yeah. Connie, we're not following them in any state. I, I mean, let's just let's let's, you know, I don't like to sugarcoat anything, but right. I'm telling you, you know, yes, are there good foster parents? Yes. Yes. Are they good social workers? Yes. But I will tell you, as an overall, we get a big whopping F. Yeah, we do. Fail when it comes to kids in foster care. I mean, 438,000 kids and only 54 percent of them graduate from high school. Well, and, 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 you know, and I always say, because, you know, Florida gives you this incentive of adoption, um, uh, in adoption of college education, 3% are able to utilize it. Yeah. 3%. 3%. Is that right. not the craziest? I mean, this is an industry that makes money on the backs of children, you know, because yeah. we definitely aren't investing that money into them. Correct. You know, that is something that we're just not doing, you know. 
Connie, I've been following you. Um, I've I followed you for a long time on social media, but just recently, um, probably you, I think you started it during the pandemic, but you actually started a, a private group. I do. I have an, I have a, every Thursday night at nine o'clock, I run a Zoom support group for adoptive parents. Foster parents can come too, because um, many of them become adoptive families. And um, it has been essential. At first, I thought it was doing a service, but I was healing myself too. Really? The isolation like of, of the pandemic and not having communication with people. I mean, you would talk to your friends on the phone, or, but it was so hard. And so we do it at nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which gives um, most people the chance to get their kids down or settled or um, at least in a place. And they bring their coffee, their ice cream, their glass of wine, their pajamas, come as you are. And you see some of them are hiding in their bedroom, literally hiding in their bedroom. And you'll hear a knock and they'll deal with it. You know, it, it's, it's that moment that you just don't want to miss. It's, T totally essential. Totally yeah. essential. You know, I have, um, I've, I've followed that, um, that group and, um, this is pretty hard for me. Um, I've read so many comments and I haven't really talked. This is the first time I've talked about this, but I have a son, my beautiful, beautiful boy, Grayson. I always used to call him my mini me. He has been gone since August. He suffers from reactive attachment disorder. Um, it's been probably one of the hardest things that I've ever experienced, even harder than aging out and being homeless, knowing that I'm not there to hug my baby and, you know, and then he doesn't want to be hugged. Um, but I will tell you the last couple of weeks has been really, really hard. And it's been your post and your comments of your people that follow you that have pulled Greece and I through some of the hardest times, Connie. You know, people see this perfect so picture glad that family. We're there no, I. <laughs> they don't know. They, you they know, know, they don't. They don't. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, you know, having a child with reactive attachment disorder is um, it's hard. Um, but I will say, I read this on your post, Connie, a parent who's dealing with the same thing, my husband and I, and as a matter of fact, I, I read it to Reese and I said, this is like a mirror, um, same age, same every, I mean, it was just everything. Um, and the thing that I heard from you was don't give up, don't give up. And that's what I just remind myself every day is I love you, Grayson. You're always going to be my son and I'm never, ever giving up. How do you help parents like us, Connie? Well, you have to have, I think, been there yourself. And, you know, I adopted two, two boys, one in particular, who definitely lived that diagnosis. Um, and, you know, having him from a younger age, even at 12, I wasn't able to heal that wound. Um, but I knew what the families who had had him before, and he had actually been given back by his first adoptive family and because they couldn't manage the behaviors at that point. And I don't hold anger for them. Um, I wish they would have hung in. Um, but you only can do what you can do as a family. And there's no right or wrong and there's no judgment is that people do not understand what it is like to live with a child that is, there's an empty spot between here and there. And um, my son would tell me often, he would say, I wanna feel like I love you. I wanna feel it, but it just is empty there. There's nothing there. And so I said, that's okay. I love you enough for both of us. And we're gonna help you fill that cup that has all the holes in it that just keeps running out. And no matter what you do in your life, I will still be your mom. And whether you live here or whether you live you know, somewhere else. And as an adult, I say to him, whether you go on to finish college and have the career that you dream of, or you end up in prison because of choices, I will, I will still be your mom and I will still visit you. Yeah. It is, it is a, it's very hard to describe because when your family has a safety issue 
And I'm going to tell you, I could not have adopted um, with younger children in the home for my, for my family. And the toll that it took for, and I say this very honestly, I had nobody to share this with, which was why I created the Facebook closed, very secure group that I screen everybody that comes in. And, you know, I, I had nobody to tell that, you know, there was, there were, there were physical, um, you know, assaults, there were things being thrown, there were anger. I mean, it was a scary time. And we have all survived as a family, but you know, um, my, my biological, um, I have a biological child that went through a lot because they were close in the same age and it was, became the target. And um, it's, it, we're all still family, but it's extremely difficult. And, um, but that's what that is. I feel like we're chosen for this, Rob. He was chosen to be your son. Mine was chosen to be my son. You know, I just figure our guardian angels must think that we are incredibly amazing. <laughs> but no, you know. you're amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I, it, I, like I said, I haven't shared. Um, and I haven't shared Connie, not because I'm worried about what anybody else says. Right. It's none of their business. Um, I haven't shared because I also don't want to scare people away from adopting out of foster care. It, it's a fine line. And, and what I say to people, you know, all different levels of children in foster care from, you know, some that aren't as exposed in utero that have less trauma that are more resilient. And um, then there are the extremely children that are more damaged than you know, even though you begin to, to love them at an early age. You know, I sort of was told what I was getting, um, but that still didn't prepare me because once you're in it, it is, you think you, I, I thought I had all the tools to handle what was given to me. And I, and I knew I wasn't going to ever give up and not be his mom, but nobody prepared me for the isolation or the loneliness. And then of course with the media, it was a fine line because I want to tell people it's apple pie and lollipops and white picket fences, but you don't want to scare them away. So there's that, that medium ground to where you do share you know, um, I, and how I learned this was um, Taylor before Davy, um, so my first son, he had some media with Steve Hartman on, um, and he came out to the house and I said to Taylor, I said, do you want to cover the holes in your wall? He had big holes in his wall and he'd made it bigger. And I, he said, no, this is, this is who I am. This is who I am. And I thought if he can be that brave, I can certainly be that brave. And so it's always, I try really hard not to tell their story. I want them to tell their story, but, so they have a video that whenever I speak, I share of them talking about it, but I have permission to share because they know it will help a family hold on. It will help another child who's giving up. And I think that gives your life a bigger purpose. You're right, you know, you're right. It, it is it is all about giving life a purpose and you know connie it is an absolute pleasure it's been so amazing to talk to you for me to unload the way i did um it, it's i'm lucky because you're my friend and um i'm gonna get through this my husband's gonna get through this my other four children are gonna get through this and we're always going to be the shears. And um, and my son is always going to be my son, no matter what you just said, no matter what choices, choices he makes, he's going to be my son, just like your kids are going to always be your children. Listen, Connie, I am again in awe with you. This is not the last time you're going to be on Fostering Change. I think it would be absolutely amazing if we could get a round table together. Let's do it. Let's do it and really talk about change. Um, because, you know, one of the things, if you had a magic wand right now and you could change something about our foster care system, what would it be? Oh. By the way, we know that there are a ton of things that need to be there changed. There are. There are. Yeah. My brain is turning. Um, I would want to reduce the amount of trauma our children experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I, let me tell you, that's a good, good point, because, you know, you, you look at the fact of trauma and everybody needs to really understand this, that if you look at the percentage of children that actually come into foster care because of abuse, it's not it's a small percentage, by the way, mm -hmm. it's a very small percentage. And I do believe that a child who is abused, broken ribs, bleeding of the brain, shaken baby syndrome, whatever those they, those children need a place to go. Simple as that. There's no doubt in my mind. But 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 the trauma that we cause for the kids who are the quote neglect, you know, is is is, is a trauma that we could avoid, by the way, you know. It is. My boys, honestly, their trauma came from foster care. They came, they came, they came with the mothers, but it truly, truly most of their trauma occurred in foster care. It occurred in foster care. And, you know, I was just, I was interviewing someone and he went through foster care, really abused as a kid. And I asked him what people ask me all the time when they, after reading my book, um, why didn't I tell somebody? Why didn't I tell a social worker? Why didn't I tell a teacher? And it's because, and I said this to this gentleman, I said, because you don't know what's behind the next door, that the okay. next door could be worse than what you're dealing with right now. And I think you as a social worker, see the look at that, he coming to say goodbye to me, you know, <laughs> I'm coming to say goodbye, look at that. There, it's always, always something <laughs> happening in fostering change. Well, Connie, listen, I absolutely love you. I cannot wait for this other side of the pandemic for us to wrap our arms around each other because you are definitely in my top top that I need to see. I need some of that Connie love and not just talking here. Listen, everyone, please do me a favor. Go to ConnieGoing.com. Um, you want somebody who wants to, you want a motivational speaker? You want someone to come to your company, to your, to your event, to your conference, and really talk about how to be part of a change? Um, Connie is my friend who you guys need to book because she, I've heard her speak. I have been following her. Please follow her on social media. Spread the word about her amazing organization, you know, at Family Blooms. Um, I am so thrilled, as I said earlier, to call her my friend. Listen, do us a big favor at Fostering Change. Share, share our podcast. Make sure that you share and leave a review. Um, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Support our sponsors. Oh my gosh, the fact that people actually, we have sponsors so we can do this every single week. Um, be part of the change. And Connie, I send you all my love. Thank Take you. care. Thank Take you. care. I would like to thank all of you for listening to the Fostering Change podcast. You can subscribe on all of your favorite podcast streaming platforms, including Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Make sure you follow Comfort Cases on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at Comfort Cases. Check out the Fostering Change blog at comfortcases.org. And I know some of you have a question. And I know some of you would love to be a guest. Please personally reach out to me at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. That's fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Then do me a big favor. Please help spread the word. Share this podcast. Share it with your friends and your family. Remember, I say this quite often. We're all part of the same community, and that community, it's not our zip code, but our human race. Let's all make a difference.